Their service also provides a fine opportunity for the pastor to establish a closer relationship with them and to better identify their needs as young Christians. The church that establishes an acolyte program will discover, with the passage of time, that it not only renders a better service to its congregation, but it is also laying a foundation so that those who are serving as acolytes may have a closer relationship with their church as they reach adulthood. Participants of this ministry will be filled with a sense of spiritual meaning and fulfillment as they grow in knowledge and faith about the meaning of worship. They will carry with them pleasant memories of their childhood as they served in this important ministry of the church. This time, we'll, <coughs> excuse me, consecrate a cross necklace that will be worn by the acolyte carrying the light of Christ at the beginning of each worship service. <coughs> the cross, the instrument of torture upon which Christ died, is the most well known symbol of Christianity. What could possibly explain to two millennia long fixation or something so horrible? One clue is Jesus' final words in John 30. 1930. He uttered when he died, it is finished. That victorious declaration spoken in the midst of what looked like humiliating defeat tells us that Jesus saw these events <clears throat> as an accomplishment. On the cross, a divine transaction took place. It was his life for hours, a ransom paid to buy us back from our lost condition. That's why the day Jesus died is called Good Friday, not Tragic Friday. Jesus' death on the cross completed the work that God gave him to do because his mission was not just to teach us, but to die for us. The resurrection declared Jesus as victor over death and humanity's most unsolvable problem. By rising, he showed that even death was no match for his power. The resurrection assures us that power beyond human comprehension is available to the followers of Jesus. The power of, his res of the resurrected Jesus comes to us through his spirit. God's desire was for every Christian to have access to his personal presence and power. At Pentecost, 50 days after his resurrection, that's what happened. Jesus was clear. The Holy Spirit comes so we can be his witnesses by being like him. The cross, the resurrection, and the Holy Spirit, these set Christianity apart from every religion. Embrace them all, and your life will never be the same. Let's pray. <clears throat> Blessed are you, Lord, King, King of the universe. You have made all things for your glory. We thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross and then rising for us. Bless this cross necklace and grant that we may use it in your service and use it for the good of your people. We also ask your blessing upon the one who wears the cross necklace. And Father, we pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Today we do recognize and honor the ministry of the Acolyte and we want to install them in the service of ministry. Dear Christian friends, baptized into the priesthood of Christ, each of us is called to offer ourselves in service to the Lord of the church and to do that in thanksgiving for what he has done and continues to do for us. As an assembly of believers, it is our privilege to recognize those who are engaged in the work of this congregation, especially those who lead us in worship through the ministry of accolade. The list is in the, your bulletin of those who have completed the training and the instruction. To you, our acolytes, from the Holy Scriptures, we find that light has special significance to the worshipers of God. 
In the book of Genesis, God created the world and separated the light from the darkness to show his creation and glory. In the book of Exodus, we find that God led his people through the wilderness to the promised land and did that by a pillar of fire to light the way in the darkness. In the Gospel of John, Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. The light you will carry, the light around which you gather in worship, reminds us of the presence of God, a presence we can gather in only because of the forgiveness we have received in Jesus. It reminds us that we are followers of Christ, the light. In the Gospel of John, the 10th chapter, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. They follow me, and I give them eternal life. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus said, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. All who claim Christ as their Lord are followers of Jesus. For an acolyte, that is the first and most important discipline you can do. But an acolyte does more than just follow an acolyte is one who leads the congregation in their worship of God. As an acolyte, you will carry the light of Christ for us to see as we become together in worship and as we give thanks to our Lord. Most importantly, you will be bearers of the light for this congregation, the ones who remind us of the light of Christ, the light we follow. So therefore, I ask each of you in the presence of the congregation, are you willing to undertake the responsibility and role of being an acolyte in this place of worship? If so, will you answer yes with the help of God? Yes, with the help of God. And having offered yourselves in the acolyting ministry of the congregation, will you follow our Lord's example of humble service to others in this world? If so, yes, with the help of God. Recipients of ministry, that in our worship your name may be glorified. 
your people and live in peace and your will will be done. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. together this little light of mine. Do things 
that make us sad, and we have to ask them for forgiveness, but we also need to forgive as well. Okay? They need to forgive us, so we need to forgive them. Okay? It goes both ways. If we ask to be forgiven, we must also forgive. And when you choose to forgive others, you are also allowing yourself to be forgiven by God. So, we're bringing God into this too. So when we ask for that forgiveness, and we give that forgiveness to the other person, when we are asked, we're also allowing God to forgive us also. And it's not easy. When we forgive someone, there is an element of pain that we feel. It hurts when somebody does something wrong to us. And when we choose to forgive, we can hand that pain to Jesus and thank him for absorbing that pain for us and be at peace about the hurt that we felt. Forgiveness does not equal trust. Trust is earned. And so forgiveness has benefits. Proverbs 17, 22 says, A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. We can find freedom in forgiveness, and the benefits of this are peace and comfort, love and joy. So choosing forgiveness is just one of many ways to be a good witness of what God is like in how he loves and forgives us. So if you want to come up here, we'll have a word of prayer, and then I have a snack for you.
Heavenly Father, as we continue this Lenten season, we come asking that you continue to hear us as we pray. That you would help us as we strive every day to continue to grow spiritually in our faith and in our witness. And Father, we come thanking you for this time of the year that we call the Lenten season, where we examine our lives and our relationship that we have with you. We remember your life. We remember how willing you were to give it so that we could have the abundant life. So as we pray, we ask that you would search our hearts, see if there is something in our lives where we need your forgiveness or we need your attention. And then we ask that you hear us as we begin to pray for all of those needs that we have heard about. For we've heard of so many. We know those like Marilyn and Terry uh, who continue to heal from their surgeries. We remember those like Carolyn in the nursing home and those like Jenny and Lizzie who are in need of our prayers today. We pray for husbands and wives in their marriages. We pray that you would continue to be with each prodigal son and daughter that we know about. And when we think of needs, we can't help but think of the need there is today in your church, especially in some positions of leadership. But we ask that we all might continue to be faithful to the truth of your word. We can't listen to the news without being concerned for what's happening in our world, from weather disasters to the disasters of war, or to the concerns that we have about our upcoming presidential election. Although we know our world is in trouble, but we know that it always has been. But we pray that you would continue to be with those so they can continue to be faithful to you and the truth of your word, especially as they lead. I ask that you would remind us every day of just how blessed we are. And we're blessed only because we live where we do. We live where there are problems to be sure, but we're not living in a war zone like so many are today. We're not living in famine like they are in places like Africa. Forgive us. Forgive us for we take for granted all that we have. The peace that we have in this country. We often forget that there are many people today who have no place to call home. There are people today that will have nothing to eat. So forgive us. Because we have come from the warmth of our homes and its safety. We had the heat and electricity. We made choices about what we were going to have for breakfast. Choices about what we were going to wear. We don't have to worry about what we're going to eat later today. We'll have safe water to drink and all the basic needs of our lives will be met. So help us. Help us to be thankful for our freedoms, for the blessings that we have and the privileges that are ours every day. May we never take them for granted. And help us to especially remember the privilege and opportunities that we have to pray. And when we think of our prayer life, help us to use the model that you gave the disciples so long ago for when they asked you to teach them how to pray, you said use this model and pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed it be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Our scripture lesson today is from 1 John, and I would like you to read the lesson with me, please. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. Our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declared to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And they have become alive in our all of us today. It's still the Lenten season, and the questions that we have been asking are still good questions for us to daily be answering. Like, am I sensitive to God's presence? Do I delight in Jesus? Are the spiritual disciplines important to me? Am I concerned about others? The question today is, do I grieve over my sin? I was taught in seminary that the first step in attaining a higher standard of holiness in my life was to realize more fully my sin and my sinfulness. And the closer that I get to Jesus, the more I hate my sin. Because he hates sin as well. So, the more we become like Jesus, the more we will want to grow in our faith and hate our sin. The hymn writer was correct when he didn't write, I was sinking deep in sin, yippee. He wrote, rather, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters lifted me. Now safe am I, for love lifted me. If we know anything about the Apostle Paul, we know of the importance of his letter to Timothy when he wrote, Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. It's no secret that like Paul, every believer struggles with sin. Every non-believer doesn't because they're not concerned about their sinning. I like how A.W. Pink explained it in one of his writings. He wrote, it is not the absence of sin, but the grieving over it which distinguishes the child of God from all others. So the question for today is, and the question for this week, am I aware of my sin? If I am, am I willing to continue to grow in my faith through repentance. In reality, we all need to be lifelong repenters 
and lifelong believers. The initial experience we had when we turned from our sin and trusted Jesus should characterize our life every day because repentance and faith are to be daily components of Christian living. It's never just one and done. Paul would write in his second letter to the Corinthians regarding sin and how he later rejoiced in its result. As it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved concerning your sin, but because you were grieved unto repentance. And as we know, when some people sin, nothing changes. There's no repentance, there's no guilt, but the result is they lose their joy. If we know anything about King David, we know he was a great sinner. He was an adulterer, he was a murderer. And when he realized what he had done, he was a very unhappy man. But you'll notice as you read the scripture that God called him in Acts 13, 22, a man after my heart. How could he do that? He could do it because David was also a great repenter. The psalmist says in the 51st Psalm, God centeredness of grief is something like this. I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. This 51st Psalm is addressed to God. It overflows with 31 specific references to him in just those 19 <coughs> verses. And David teaches us that godly grief is Godward grief. For when our focus is on God, when it's not on ourselves, we can hope for grace. We can pray expectantly with David when he prayed, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. Like David, we need to grieve over our sin. And do that so we can be more holy. And do that so we can continue to grow in our faith. And if we seriously want to do this, we need a personal spiritual checkup on a regular basis. And there we could begin by asking God to show us specifically when we sin, how we're sinning, why we sin, and against whom we sin. For praying then slowly through this 51st Psalm like King David, we would be praying, have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, wash away my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. When you get a chance, look at that first, that 51st Psalm and look at how personally David is writing. Have mercy on me. Wash away my iniquity. Cleanse me. Create in me. Pretty personal. It's always easier to point out the sin of someone else. But like David, we need, especially in the Lenten season, to make it personal. And then maybe we can take our Bibles and see what St. Paul told Timothy and know that he would tell us the same thing when he said all Scripture is God breathed. It's useful for teaching and rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may thoroughly be equipped for every good work the reason Jesus was nailed to the cross. Sin. It caused his death. 
But notice also the scripture says we all have sinned and fallen short of His glory. And we all are to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So every day we need to preach the gospel. But we especially need to preach it to ourselves. Saying, do as I say and not as I do is still not a good witness. So in order to attain a higher standard of holiness in our life, we need to realize our sinfulness and that sin that so easily besets us. And this Lenten season is a very good time to specifically look at our own life and then realize the closer that I get to Jesus, I'll have godly sorrow for my sin. But it will lead me to repentance. And it will hopefully rid my desire to commit that sin again. And my repentance will lead to salvation. And will enable me to live the Christian life that He's calling me to live. And a life that's up to date. So, is your relationship with Jesus up to date? It can be. Especially if we would take that 51st Psalm and pray it just like David did. And then remember as we read at the beginning, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we'll have fellowship with one another as the blood of Christ purifies us from all our sin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, with David, we would pray, cleanse me, and I'll be clean. Create in me a pure heart. Renew my spirit within me. If we would do that, we could begin to truly live the life that you are calling us to live. So help us once again today to surrender to you so that can happen. For we pray in your matchless name.